we haven't set them up. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the school board work session for uh, May 4th, uh, 2010. If I could ask the superintendent to take the roll call for tonight. Ian Mayer? Here. Harold Chelman? Here. Kent LePage? Present. Dexter Lake? Here. Ian Walker? Here. Mitch Shulman? Here. Rebecca Remerson? Here. Tom Martin? Here. Leslie Stevens? Here. Lisa Sweet? Here. Linda Brulette? Here. Philip Boynton? Okay. Um, so uh, we're here uh, at the, uh, I guess, the behest of, from our last meeting with the City Council uh, for the school board to talk a little more amongst ourselves about the budget. So before we actually begin to do that, I'd like to turn it over to the superintendent and uh, he can fill us in on some uh, new information. Yes, I'd, I'd like to share two pieces of information. One is um, following the City Council meeting on the 21st, um, I did uh, have a visit um, with uh, the teachers union leadership we had a conversation um, and they were wondering about ways they might help the, the, the budget process you know in FY 11 um, my understanding is today they had a, a, a membership meeting and they voted I believe 94 to 44 or somewhere in that order Linda 97. Thank you. 97 to 44 to basically go forward and have a conversation or a dialogue with the school committee to, to see if there are ways they could help uh, advance this, this budget this year. The second piece of information that I would share before we begin is um, SAU 50. I know Steve Bartlett has worked closely with the business manager over there and with George Cushing uh, to kind of look at the revenues um, because we have been told all along we're going to see an increase in the number of students coming to Portsmouth High School. And so we had expected a $500,000 increase in revenue uh, next year. And in fact, we've, we've kind of compared notes, looked at the numbers, and I know the city staff has looked at it as well, uh, Ms. Belanger. And uh, it looks like we can count on another, safely count on another $350,000 in revenue. So it's an increase of some $850,000. So I would share that with the board as well. Okay. Just a uh, yep. point of reference to the superintendent, seeing how that the union has asked to have dialogue, I request uh, non-vote uh, that uh, superintendent set up in the next two weeks a uh, meeting with the uh, school board negotiating team to have a discussion workshop session with the union in the next, no later than two weeks, whatever it is from okay. today. Sooner rather than later. Okay. Works, okay. Uh, works for everybody. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, so a new piece of information really is uh, this question of new revenue, which is quite a bit. Uh, I don't have an agenda of how we're really going to run this meeting this evening. So what I'd like to do is maybe ask the superintendent to pass out uh, the scenarios that we that, uh, we've had in the past. It'll have some new numbers on it, which sort of give a price tag to certain um, suggestions that they've made in the in that whole 96% budget. Uh, and then I'd like to go around and have people uh, talk and see where your thoughts are at. So, so really what I'd like to share with you is the, the work that the administrative team did uh, some time ago, I, I think it was mid-January, in order to submit the 96% impacts on the budget. And so if you're looking at the, there's two sides to it, please look at the side that has the listing of personnel and the dollar amounts associated oh, with it. it. Oh, All right. Well, yes, she does. Sorry. She does. Okay. I do. Does everyone have that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, one of the one of the points we made all along um, in in developing this budget is we wanted to protect the instructional core, the protect those 139 plus classroom teachers. Um, then, as we moved out to the unified arts, we protected all unified arts offerings and those teachers there as well. And as you recall, we made some modest adjustments with, with student support services, particularly in special education because of some decreased numbers. And then we sustained all other programming, extra and co-curricular activities. And so when we put this budget together, you will see that um, uh, the process we used was to pretty much look at each of the principals and to go further down on their list to see how they would help us achieve that 96 percent. And um, this isn't in any order particularly, but it's clear when one looks at it that it has an impact on programming at each of the schools. For example, when asked at the elementary school level, um, each of the principals said, well, they would eliminate one paraprofessional at the elementary school, 
they would look to eliminate elementary band and if you go down a little bit further they talked about eliminating full day K and going back to a half day kindergarten option and you can see the the numbers associated with that is that the reduced three elementary teachers no that's in it and that's the other place you'll okay. see a reduction yeah. and a little further down Where's right the it's further down Mitch okay as I said this was not this was this list was not put together by school gotcha. it was kind of a round robin uh, exercise and then we looked at the the middle school and and John Stokel um, looked at two ELA positions at the middle school he also because we have a, a rich uh, unified arts program talked about reductions of staffing in art family and consumer science and tech ed and making those reductions so that you would offer half the program that you currently offer um, at the middle school he also um, I'm trying to see I know there were no other adjustments at the middle school and then at the high school you can see that Jeff talked about um, a guidance clerical position and a point three three art position uh, nurse at the high school and a uh, world languages teacher and then and a math teacher as well and then CTE and then um, when we looked at the administration we talked about uh, two positions there the assistant superintendents the technology director and a clerical position and the sum total of those is some 2.5 million dollars which gets you to the 96 percent clearly they are not adjustments any of us wants to make I'll stand by the 2.8 percent that keeps the district moving forward I think it would it would it's clear on its face that it will impact programming at any one of our schools mm -hmm. to, to go further than we than where we are currently but that's the list we put together it, um, uh, we can talk at length about impacts if you wish but I that's what we that's our list Does the other side look any better or not much better next uh, <laughs> so this is the good side <laughs> Carol uh, could you just explain the middle school um, what that would be I just could you explain that a little more yes yeah, so yeah. so what I, would happen I, at the middle school in the uh, unified arts yes well they have um, currently two art teachers two right. family and consumer science and two right. tech ed teachers okay so th clearly there'd be an impact in the in the delivery of the program the amount of time students get the programming you, you're, not, you're gonna only be able to offer half as much and, it, it'll, and it'll, so it'll have a you know right. negative impact for sure like for a particular student what exactly would be the I wish John were here to speak he well, could. wouldn't it be a study hall? I mean, haven't yeah. we? Don't it, other, yeah, I, mean, I think that's other programs have a study hall where kids. So, if you have twelve weeks of family and consumer science, now you have six weeks in study hall. Ah, uh, okay, great, thank you. And on the music and the on the art side, as opposed to having the opportunity of two different art classes and disciplines, it would be one and a study hall. Right. Less instruction. Right. Um, Supposedly for study. After we tried to get rid of the study halls. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, Ed, has the administration tried to establish any sort of priorities at this point with these, or you've um, just worked with each of, of the schools to identify possible reductions? And have you, have, have you stepped back and said, from a district-wide perspective, here, here's how we would um, rank order these additional Candidly reductions? Candidly, no, Dexter, no. Okay. Well, and to be fair, I mean, I think the administration did a good job of identifying the three fundamental objectives. No, absolutely. You know, that I we're just want to understand to protect. Where, where we are in the process. Yeah. Right. Rebecca. So, <clears throat> at some point, I think it seems like we're going to have to look at our programming. I mean, I hope not. Um, and I think we are going to have to, you know, figure out if if everything that we offer is imperative. You know, I mean, I I love everything that we offer. I think it's wonderful, but you know, who knows what the council's going to do? Who knows what next year is going to bring? So, I think at some point we de do need to take a, a really in-depth look, and and then we can have an answer for why having a study hall for six weeks instead of a second, you know, class is is important, um, and then find out if what we are offering is is really worth it. You know, and I don't know if that's a curriculum council discussion or something, but you know, we just we offer so much, and I know that we want to offer even more. 
And I just want to make sure that everything that we do currently offer is mm -hmm. is absolutely the best that we're doing. You know, I don't want to keep something around that's not successful. And I'm not implying that there's anything like that. But. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, uh, Kent, were you going to well, say something? My question is: Is are you going around the table? Is this your go around the table time? Or uh, I guess we could start. We could I mean, start. I mean, this no, was just a little free for all okay. conversation. With people, I mean, but it, you, I have a process question. Sure. As thing. we as we drive towards this, because um, we've identified what we would have to uh, potentially cut to get to ninety six percent. Right. And I understand that we've been asked to pick certain um, steps towards that 96% or 4% reduction. Um, do we know what those steps are? In other words, ha have we sort of agreed that we're going we're gonna to report back um, on, on if it would be um, a 1% reduction, a 2%, 3%, 4%, or is it because, because I, I believe we've been asked to, to group some of these reductions. And so, so do we have a, do we have a, I, I, my question is, is there a process in place, a target to say, well, all right, we, 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 this, here's how we're going to report back. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to report back um, on a 1% on to get to 4%. So four, four buckets, two buckets? Well, I have to say, um, there's a part of me, I mean, we'll, we'll uh, part of me feels like we'll deal with it when the number comes to us, although we'll have conversations, I suppose, as to what order that would come. But at the same time, if the conversations and dialogue and work session with the union and the extra $350,000 helps us solve this problem this year, which is really a Band-Aid for helping not increase the tax rate as, as high as it seems to have to be unless there's some things done and adjustments made, if this moves towards that in the short term, uh, then I'm happy not having that conversation. Well, let me ask it differently. Yeah, I, I think uh, um, um, uh, setting those aside, the fact that we're going to get three hundred thousand dollars in revenue and and uh, discussions with the teachers union may lead to um, something. Maybe. Um, um, what, what's the deliverable coming out of this discussion? In other words, what what are we going to report back to the city? It just will help me understand because. Although we can go around the room and prioritize these in some fashion, each each person is going to have their own, Absolutely. Their, their Absolutely. own uh, and, 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 and the question is, does it make sense at this point to try and drive to consensus for that or not? Right. And because because I'm not sure um, we, we can we can gain that consensus That's right. until we have a, a clear number from the city that says your budget is no more than X. Right. And at that point, we can have the hard discussion right. about what does that really mean. But until that, yeah. are we going to try and achieve consensus for those steps? Well, or, well it's I'm not. You, you, a well, and, and I think it's a fair question. And, and while the question was raised by, I believe, Councilor Spear and echoed by the mayor, I don't. we never got a formal correspondence that said this is exactly what we'd like to see now. So we're kind of operating um, in good faith in, in a little bit of a vacuum. But I felt it important, you know, in terms of sharing our list so folks had a sense of what those impacts would be for certain. I mean, we're not, there's nowhere to go here in this budget without impacting programs. That's my point. Are you right. questioning whether it's uh, worth having this meeting because no, 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 we don't I'm not. have a number? No, but what I, I'm questioning is, is that as, as we work as a group, what are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. right. what, what are we going to, at the end of this work session or process, what, what are we going to deliver? Because if, if we don't know that, it'll be an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. But it'll be an interesting discussion. Right. That's that's all I'm that's all I'm I'm asking, and 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 I, I don't yeah I don't mean to be difficult, but, but no, I understand no, I once we get into this thing. No, I don't think it's going to be right. I mean, I don't have I don't know if I personally just as as one member of the board, I don't know if I have an answer. Uh, I was asked by at the last council meeting whether I, we were comfortable with the budget we have in, and I said yes, and I am comfortable with the budget we have in. You know, and so if the city council and I understand where they're coming from, and they you know it's a really a tax issue, uh, if they come back with a lower number, then I think I'd be ready to sit down and roll up my sleeves and work. So this is what I propose, and I, I don't want to cut off the discussion, but okay. Um, I, I, unless the, we all agree. Um, to one level or another, that each of these is going to cut program. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 um, at, at one level um, the City Council can't judge what program is more important than the other right. we can um, right. but what they can judge is um, we, we are going to spend no more than than X this year in the school system right and until they tell us what that is right it seems it seems difficult to begin to try and prioritize these and say that the first the, now saying if we have to cut one percent it's going to be this stuff and two percent it's going to be this stuff right exactly. I, I'd, I'd rather know you got to cut two percent right. yeah I mean, and, and then and then it's like okay now we can have a real discussion because yeah. then it's just it's it's just sort of theory yeah. I'm in total agreement with you yeah, Kent, and then it's yeah. arbitrary and it's sort of Yes. Yes. Hypothetical. Hypothetical. I, 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 I have some ideas and thoughts, and I understand what Dexter's saying, and I think I heard same discussion, but I think there, there's at least one solid thing we go out tonight is that additional right. revenue. So that, that that's something that, that that's solid, it's tangible. It's the only thing I think we probably will go out with tonight. But what I also heard, and, and again, I'm not, I'll am not. i wait till my turn to go around with some of my suggestions. I took the time since that meeting to come up with both new income which I think was well said there, and I know I had a brief discussion with Ed about one of the things that I, I would like to see us propose towards them back, because they said if we could show you know, income coming, that they'd even spend money. I heard that from three different counselors. Absolutely. Oh, yes. yeah. oh. But then on the other side is, is that, um, as, as, as I'm hearing this, I, I agree that with this list, but we need to also look at this. If you take the 96%, and I don't think it was done on purpose, but if you take 96% and you take exactly what this year's budget would have been, this is next year's budget. You're looking at something, let's say that they agree upon this, and if they come back and next year say, once again, you're going to be zero. Right. This oh, yeah. is zero. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we absolutely. need to start tonight to show them what we're going to work with. I know I took some things here, and there's a couple on the list here that I may or may not agree with. But I, again, zero next year equates to just what we were given. So we do need to let them know where we're thinking so that they, they want two-year plans. I heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can show that we're going to try to beat so we don't have to have some of these reductions. So I know I have that. Just a quick point, though, of order of that $850,000 coming from SAU 50, I want it to be known that that's pretty static after this. It's not going to increase from what, what we've been told much more. And, you know, if any of it goes down, so next year we're $850,000, no new money that we can throw back to the city council. So, you know, uh, that scares me a little bit. When we find money and we see this nice increase and then it goes static, and then if we don't have a product in front of people, uh, SAU families may say, I'm taking my child out because they can find that product elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We have to have a product for them to buy. And uh, again, I emphasize, 96% equates to a two-year budget if at zero approximately. And I'll, I'll wait until my turn to go through okay. my suggestions. So we'll go to Ann, and then we can start to go around and people can talk. Thank you. I just had a question on the other side of the sheet where um, it reflects some numbers where we get down, if we in include a possible figure um, from possibly the teachers union, but then that five five hundred and twenty eight thousand dollar number, is that the number that gets us it from that to zero? Is that what you're trying to reflect, Ed? You know, that's the, an the, additional the, amount of money that we would have to get. If you want to get this, you know, I was I was I was. Yeah. Presupposing the buckets Dexter was referring to, okay. I think. But you that, didn't that get us to this year's budget. But you didn't include in that figure the 350 from SAU 50. In which I didn't. I didn't go on the revenues at, at all. I didn't. Okay, but in which case we're to get to zero. Mm -hmm. We're still 178 thousand shy. Is that what? Is that sort of what? Yeah, I, I guess we I. Going you know. With? I don't want the. You know what I mean? I just wanted to know why the numbers were there. I think it's supposed to reflect. We're trying to get ourselves yeah. down. The, the point I would make. The point I was making was, you know, it, it, the conversation with the city council the other evening was about, with, with some members, what, was around, was about if the teachers gave up cola, what would that amount be? So that yeah. that categorizes that. It reduces the budget on the expenditure side. Then the 1.45 to get to a zero budget, you still have to go another 500 and some odd thousand in. That's all I was suggesting. Okay. Nothing more than that. 
Okay. And I and I agree with Kent that it, that even going forward, regardless, of, you know, if we are able to come up with enough revenues to, to not Ideas. impact the budget in, in any way, the things that start being very drastic. The, what happens to the vision for next year? Mm -hmm. the year you know, I mean, ultimately right. down the road, um, we need to be looking at some kind of sustainable right. path. I agree. And I think, uh, you know, just, just the way I look at it, <laughs> You know, I feel like uh, this is a very fast process. It's actually a little too fast for me to think about how we're changing the school. You know, I said this way, way, way at the very beginning of the process. I was worried that uh, that a very fast process to try to save money uh, is not really reforming education. In many ways, if you're not careful, you'll dismantle it. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little nervous about it. And I, my goal, short-term goal, is to figure out a way to save as much of this budget as we can you know, call it a Band-Aid, if you will, to just get from now until the City Council votes our budget and we can move forward. And then, as we've all talked about, beginning our next budget cycle process right away. So we can answer those questions. But we can't answer those long-term questions necessarily tonight. So, okay. Kent, do you have a list? Okay, Should we start with you? Well, can you start in order? Okay. Appreciate it. Since then, I, 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 I bat around some ideas, and one of the things that caught my ear was at the City Council meeting when we met back here in April with our work session was that if we could show long-term uh, income that they would be willing to back certain programs. So I have uh, three, three suggestions towards the board to look at, and again, Long range to me is not two years. Long range to me is is, is somewhere over five. So when we look at a budget, uh, you know, two years is, is a short time for a budget. I know that I've budgeted myself out in business at least five years. And when I worked for FedEx, we were allowed up to 12 years. So I want to go over these uh, ones. And then I have some budget reductions that may re reflect this. I think um, it's time uh, to hire a full-time grant writer half pay salary, half pay from income grants at approximately $45,000 because that seems to be about the average as I would research. This new hire would be able to work with many areas finding both long-term and short-term grants, possibly new, new income to the city of Portsmouth with like districts out there show over a million dollars worth of grants, both long-term and short-term. Now, I'm well aware that long-term and short-term grants eventually come back to the taxpayers when those programs run out. So I'm not suggesting that these are short-term type programs, but without a grant writer, uh, which there are districts that do this on a per diem type basis, they do it on a compensation basis of, of uh, grant finding, um, which is highly uh, successful in many communities. I really think we need to throw that back to us as a city council, because not only would this grant writer maybe work for the school department, but quite possibly that grant writer could look at um, citywide projects too. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 there is no downside to this um, other than um, we have to find somebody that's good at it. And I, I think you, you, you can go out and find very good grant writers. And this would eliminate certain projects that we now burden on uh, administrative people to do grant writing. So it would give them more time, or they could, uh, I, I take a Steve Z. Steve Z could say, look, I'm looking at this grant. It takes Steve Z forever yeah, right. to get a grant done. He could hand that information over to that grant writer, <laughs> and then Steve Z could do one of exactly. my next suggestions yeah. down the road. Wait, before you go to the next one, just a question about that. So you're suggesting around $45,000 for salary. That's correct. Right. And what you're referring to from the city council, I talked to the councilors afterwards, is they're willing to ask the city to dip into their fund balance to pay for this extra money. That's what I was told. And, and with this one, you could actually come maybe come out as a zero if this person worked and was able to. Right. I mean, you have to uh, to allow something to be done. Okay, so this is under new revenue. And there are many professionals that, I guess, do this job. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Number two, I have to hire or create from an already existing position a building and field rental marketing agent. 
This position would be totally new, new source of income to both the city and the school department. Just uh, for suggestions, with the Hagstrom Auditorium and the small theater and over 358 classrooms empty more than 50% of the time, uh, opportunity is very large. Not to mention the new high school all-purpose field uh, income from all facilities could reach and have been shown at like-type districts to reach over two and a half million dollars. I also would ask for the school system to re-ask the city, re-ask the city on the gate income. Example of rentals, if we had just 30 days per renting the auditorium at the high school at fifty thousand, uh, at five thousand dollars per day, just again, uh, 30 days out of the year, five thousand dollars would increase and create a one hundred and fifty thousand dollar per year income. One could c quite possibly double that with little work uh, with an outstanding auditorium that we provide. The new high school athletic fields with five rentals a year at $5,000 is an additional of $25,000 or more. Also the high school cafeteria rented out at $1,000 per uh, uh, cafeteria rented out $1,000 per day with just 50 rentals is an additional five, uh, I'm sorry, $50,000. We also will, will need a person, no matter what, as things are changing in the city, to set up a youth rental such as Little Clipper footballs, Seacoast lacrosse, yearly fees that now will have to be start to look at. Just like the pool, we need to look at it and it is to the point now more than ever to run this like it should be. There are no more free lunches. So quite frankly, we sit upon, and there are like school districts, uh, one pointed out in the um, border area of uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, where they are constantly having an agent renting out their facilities. And again, um, there is income and uh, job opportunity. The third suggestion for budget new income that I have is food services, time to break the mold. Outsource the whole thing to multi-food vendors that we are willing and able to meet with. Health and nutrition standards must be met and parents want it now. Maybe we can do better than the Fed standard and make money. Example, one vendor renting a day space for just $50 per day is $9,000 a year income. <coughs> Those are just budget ideas you know, from a business person. And again, these aren't new. By the way, two of these were done in 1996 by myself. And uh, I, I strongly feel on the grant writer and on um, the uh, building rental. Budget reductions. It was well heard from what I thought the discussion from the, um, the city side that, you know, whether it's this year or next year, we need, and, and, and again, looking at what uh, Ed has given us tonight, we're in this two-year cycle. I doubt we're going to go much above 0% next year uh, as the City Council uh, gathers their thoughts in about five months from now. Time to really look at moving PEEP. This is a no less than a $60,000 per year savings. I am a very strong believer in the PEEP program, but we need to make the savings for the long term. To make that move, and I know the health uh, you know, issue a, situations over there where we take kids and we're doing all these things. Unfortunately, we're doing it at the expense of all the students. And we, 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 I remember when we rented to all those agencies, we were all over at the Jones School and those agencies were with us. And they slowly left us long before we left the program. So it has survived and will survive. And, and I think a number, and, and, and you know, I, I know Nancy Clayberg sometimes rides it a little bit, but and, and she does. She has a child who went through this, and we know that in the high school setting, it could be extremely successful. Second suggestion on reductions, and I see that we have our assistant superintendent within this list, and this is where I think I, I, uh, I cross with this um, to, to make sure we don't put in jeopardy in the next year to two years our assistant superintendent. I think it's time that we look at uh, the, a couple of administrative positions. The SPED directed to be a three, uh, to be eliminated and a three person shared area. How this would be accomplished is, is that the PEEP director picks up the pre K to fifth grade. Two, past director picks up sixth to twelfth grade. And Steve Z would be the overseer and acting as the director of that. And again, this is not 
if we take maybe grant writing and, and other duties uh, down the road that, that have it, what we're looking for, Steve, is to administer with two uh, already established administrators that we have to work with them to pick up other parts of the program. Again, it's unusual for a school system to have a special ed director, a PEEP director, and a past director, so I think there's opportunity there. The savings would be around $85,000 per year in salary. As much as it hurts me to say, I, need, I think we need to relook, and I've had this conversation since that city council meeting we had in April with a number of people. Why is it that we have, and I think it's more of a discussion point than anything, why is it we have uh, five top administrative positions at the high school area? And those five administration positions are we have a principal, two assistant principals, we have the director of technology, and we also have uh, Russ Wilson there under the, um, under the uh, athletic department. And they're quite right. I think we need to better tell the story. And I've had the discussion earlier today because, with Jeff because I'm not trying to surprise anybody. I talked to him and said these are you know, things that I'm hearing. So again, some realignments with that might have a savings as over $95,000. And I'm not saying an elimination, but what can we do to show that? Lastly, one that I've harped on for a number of years, and hey, look, I love vacations. I had one about nine years ago. Time to get to just one vacation in winter and spring. <laughs> Combining over the next two years, winter break and spring, to just one March vacation would have a building savings of startup and shutdown costs of approximately $75,000 when you look at what it costs to run the schools on a uh, daily basis. So there are things that we can do. Some of these are short term, but again, uh, uh, from what I heard from the City Council, they want us to be creative. They want us to give them some ideas. So those were my suggestions. The only other two things as I looked at this uh, chart that uh, Ed gave us tonight is that um, I see the re reduce of the psychiatrist, uh, school psychiatrist um, from, uh, from the budget at 37.5. I, I just worry that's the one that catches me because I know there is a state uh, standard for that, whether we would be in compliance with the number of students we have and how, if we end up outsourcing some students, do we make a savings? And that one was the only one tonight, and I think we have had other times that you've shown that, and I apologize that I hadn't caught that before and had discussion. I uh, highly would have problems with the loss of uh, the half-day kindergarten. I think it's shown great gains in our test scores. And then eliminating of the athletics K-12. to I love athletics. It's not the sole thing of, uh, of schools. I, I quite agree that it, it, it should. It's, it's this other side of education. But I know that $850,000 that you just found from, from SAU 50, there are students that would leave because you didn't have certain sports because mm -hmm. they'll go to St. Thomas, they'll go to some of the private schools because they can't afford it. And that would be one that in the next two years they would be scared of. Last note, I think it's sad that when we have a reduction in budgets that um, I find a gentleman that has worked in the Portsmouth school system unsung for longer than I've been on the board uh, that makes $800 a year and he's a doctor. Dr. Turner, who goes around and collects all the uh, medical discharged uh, bags and so forth, uh, pretty much on a monthly basis, plus gives us uh, daunting uh, information. Just he's a, he's a wealth of information. He's an excellent community leader, uh, quiet, shy individual, but very well knowledge. Is that um, you know, he gets paid eight hundred dollars a year to do the services he does. And uh, we seldom see that in this budget, but I, I just wanted to bring that up and when I looked at the budgets and so forth. That that's, that's sad that the man has worked for the same money for better than 16 years. Thank you. Thank you. I just yes. had a clarification. Um, when you were talking about the um, administrators, I thought you said eliminating two well, it isn't. It'd be the special Aiding ed director. Blood and splitting it up. Okay. Right, one splitting it up in two, and I kind of rewrote okay. it there yep. because, again, looking at the high school, one could say, do you add or subtract one or two, or how, how does that work? But I think it's, it's something over the next 12, 16 months we have to have some serious discussion with. Mm -hmm. I didn't, does, just want to make sure I didn't. Do you think uh, eliminating a sped director, does that put us uh, in a more precarious position from liability? 
uh, perspective? I mean, Portsmouth has a history of not really being sued by parents too often because we seem to meet Correct. Them, so that could be But you're not really flaw. eliminating. You're redesigning hats. Right. And, and what I think if you look at other like districts, and yeah. I know that Ed and I have had some discussion on this, okay. is that, you know, there are assistant superintendents that carry that hat. There are, you know, okay. the, the difference is, is that we have a PEEP program and a PASS program. And that doesn't isn't out there in too many places. Right. And, and we have, you know, why is our administration looked at? And I know that just before Lisa and I were looking at things, you know, it's tough to, you can't always compare to other mm -hmm. union uh, units out there, uh, school school districts, and quite have the same flavor. We have a long, rich of. Uh, 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 flavor of working with special ed and I don't want to see that disintegrate. Uh, I think both PASS and PEEP are an outstanding program that pay off big dividends down the road by keeping students in school uh, for the whole uh, till the uh, 12th grade. So what would be the history of the SPED director? How long has it been uh, that districts have had a SPED director? I mean was it prior when inclusion when the whole inclusive inclusion movement came out about say 20 years ago mm -hmm. that's when I districts started to one. really move in that direction we've, or longer you think i think so okay we've had one here since i've been here yeah. 33 years okay. bruce bowley was the first right. was the sped director yeah. so it isn't like it was a, like a novel idea right we've never not had one mm -hmm. okay yeah. Gotcha. My, my caution would be to just look at what, what the tasks are that need to be accomplished and who does them. And so it's a, probably probably what you're suggesting at the end of the day, Kent, is to, to really look at the key tasks and who does them and how you might reorganize. How you might reorganize. Absolutely. Be, yeah. But 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 I, I wouldn't sit here tonight and say that you could eliminate a SPED director with some 400 children and all the uh, tasks right. associated with that. That would be that would be difficult. But, but perhaps, you know, looking at what are, what are those key functions that need to happen and how can we, you know, consolidate in some respects, I think is fair. Okay. So anyone else have any thoughts? Yes. Kent always brings up PEEP, and I'm not a fan of changing that program, but I would like to have some really concrete numbers, like current numbers. Is it possible? I know that we've gone down this road before, but is it possible to get current numbers and what it would take like a description of what it would take to bring that program to the high school and what we would need to do. I know there's some bathrooms that would need to be reconfigured and just have some concrete information about that because I feel like we're kind of, we, we throw it around and we talk about it, but I don't feel like I know exactly what it would require and what it would cost and what it would save. Ann, you have a question? And to go along with that, I guess it might be appropriate as well at that same time to talk about why PEEP, how PEEP came about Mm -hmm. A little bit about its history mm -hmm. and why it has been in the past in mm -hmm. that same building at the community campus with Families First and all those other, um, you know, there was some comments made with the city council that, you know, parents could get their child to whatever facility they need to and, and that, you know, the dental work that they need and that kind of thing. I think that that needs to be a part of that conversation in terms of what are the kinds of needs that those kids have and how are they appropriately place now with kids who are also typical kids mm -hmm. so they are not it's not solely um, special ed kids in that mm -hmm. program that that need to be uh, reintroduced to a typical um, environment yep. so a little explanation about that and a little history might be very helpful for some school board members yep. right and I, and I would add also um, maybe a little explanation of the curriculum of the early childhood education uh, program that is at the high school um, <coughs> where you know people say well you could just move them in there because you have a preschool there you have you know little people but there's also a curriculum that exists so I'd like to know how that would be impacted if you um, moved a different population in okay yeah so I think those numbers uh, would help I mean we've heard you know Kent has used that number about $65,000 you know, I know there would be some upfront costs. You've mentioned that yourself in the past yeah. of moving. So, so the question is, the savings would be over more of a long term, and what would that actually be with not having to pay rent? And then there's the opportunity law costs of what you're losing by moving students. Into but a caution: place. there's an opportunity on the other side. There. Well, there's every right. Right. We currently have a 
a part-time nurse that's out at PEEP. We currently have food service issues that are addressed out there that, again, you can, you know, I think I would want it very clear of the balance of what it has to offer. Like I said, at one time, PEEP was managed with PASS, and I can remember the outcry when we took the PEEP kids away from the PASS kids. This is going to be disastrous. And it was for a little while. Any, Rebecca, sorry. Um, yeah, if we're talking about revenue generating ideas, um, the tech ed center at the high school teaches real world skills. And I wonder, I know I say this all the time, we need to look into seeing if that can translate into income. Um, and then the other thing, I was having a conversation with a teacher um, at my elementary school and she lives out of district and and she uh, sends her child to St. Pat's tuitions in um, for the convenience of being, you know, in Portsmouth. And she would love to be able to tuition her child into one of the elementary schools here. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we want to think about. You know, of course, if there's room in the school. Um, but I think that says a lot that one of our teachers um, would prefer to send her own child to the school she actually works in instead of in the town she lives in. I think that says something really positive about about our schools, that she really believes in our schools. Um, Rebecca, just for a point of order, we have two teachers that currently do that. Well, so I think we need to... And, and more requesting, didn't we just Well, I think that that, that might be, you know, part of a, a broader conversation, you know. It's, it's income, of course, provided that there's room, provided, um, you know, they provide their own transportation and all these things, but I think that that's something... You know, I mean, she would she would jump at the chance, and I have a feeling besides the two that already do, um, there might be more out there. So, I think that's something that we should put on the table. And I don't know if there's a policy about it. Okay. Well, we just went through that. Yeah, I mean, we just we had that discussion. We just approved um, a well, teacher we, at New Franklin. Right, but that was a special request, and there was you know medical issues involved with that. And I have a, and I think that you know, and this other teacher said, well, I would love to be able to do that. But there's no outlet for her. There's no policy. There's no, hey, why don't you do this? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think it could be a win. It could be a win for everybody. Big money difference, though. Right. St. Pat's. They're four thousand a year. Well, I understand that, yeah. and but I think if we make that option available, well, but, but, and if we open, it sounds like it is available. She's going to yeah. pay fourteen. It sounds like I don't a couple of teachers a, well, are doing it. I, I well, one was it was a special request. It was medical issues. I don't think it's a widely Sought after. We're not, we're, right. It's not advertised. Yeah, we're not, not advertised. advertised. Maybe so, we so you got to come. You got to come and and ask. and ask rather than promote it. I mean, if so we your had, point is, we need to promote exactly. More. You know, and of course, provided well, we do have there's room problem. and all that. Right. Although in the near term, we do have an elementary bubble, and maybe adding to that enrollment. Well, and that would be looked at, and of course, each individual elementary school or middle school would be Space looked available. at. Uh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. All right. Quiet. Just to follow with what a little bit on Rebecca, in the last six years, seven years, we've had three districts come before us to look, and I know we had some discussion with Trape as early as a year ago. I'd like to see us follow up and see if there's any interest. I mean, I know, uh, Ed, you've had some maybe dialogue, and maybe there's no longer an interest there. I know New Market was interested uh, three years ago. I know Fremont has visited us, and Deerfield, oddly enough, has come to us twice. There are these other towns out there. And again, it's, it's not gr giant revenue, but for the high school and maybe the middle school, especially with the expansion of the middle school, it may be uh, very palatable to a small town that might be paying uh, more right at this point. And again, it's the opportunities. Mm -hmm. I caution that I see you know, some things starting TV media being cut from here. Somebody might be coming and that might be an interest. Athletics, you start to cut these things. You don't have it to sell anymore. Oh yeah, right. And they don't come back so easily. No, they don't. Um, so, uh, it's Carol. I just want to say I, I appreciate the comments that everybody's made so far about um, some of these ideas, um, I think that it's the kind of thing where no idea is a bad idea, mm -hmm. and the more ideas we get out on the table as right. a board, and the more we go back and forth with each other, 
um, the better decisions we'll make ultimately. And I do think that the City Council is looking for uh, something like what you've done, Ed, and I think this is very good. Uh, but I do think that they are very much looking for us to do the kind of thinking, uh, some of the ideas that Kent gave and some that Rebecca gave. I think they are really looking for us to think outside the box. I've said this before, um, to really try to rethink the way that we do things. Um, if there's any possibility that we're going to be doing anything close to 4%, um, we have to completely reorganize the way we do business. And I understand um, what was said about reform that's too quick and dismantles the system. Um, I understand that concern. Uh, but I also know that um, there's a lot of research out there right now that this um, bad economy that we've been in has resulted in a lot of really good reform um, at the business level. And um, sometimes these kinds of bad times are what brings about the reform. And so I think that we really have to stop thinking about doing business the way we've always done it and start thinking about how can we completely rethink this model. Um, and I think we're going to have to do that. Um, if it's not this year, it'll be next year. And along the lines of ideas, I know this is just a uh, very small idea. It's a very small amount of money, but I just want to throw it out there. Um, I know that we don't charge for football games. And, you know, I know it's peanuts. But um, it's something. Um, it's somewhere to start. And I think also that we should look at um, transportation um, using the, um, uh, the bus system that the city already invests in particularly for the high school students. Um, I know in Europe, um, kids get to school all the time through public transportation. It works great. It's very sustainable. Um, it's, it would be a really good way to go. Um, and it could also save us money. And then I think we should look at our athletics um, more, um, not just as a complete flat out, we go to pay to play, but look at different sports and how much they're costing us and make decisions, hard decisions, um, about, you know, what's most important. Um, and I also think I heard the City Council um, urging us to look at other tools other than class size uh, to improve education. And I think that um, they were talking about online courses using technology. Mm -hmm. And that would go also under the heading of they offered to give us more money. Um, so maybe we could come up with a plan that you leverages technology to improve the quality of education and reduce the costs in the long term. But maybe there's an initial. Um, so those are a couple of my ideas. Um, Thank you. I know in the past, I mean, I'm totally in favor of of, of being, especially at the high school level, for courses that we can't afford to hire faculty to teach because we don't have enough students. But, you know, there was a, an interest, uh, it was last year, I believe, or maybe the year before, in the virtual high school, which was mm -hmm. that online. And Susan Burrell took the initiative before anybody else did, which makes only sense because she's the technology director, um, and started exploring that by teaching in it. Because that the way that worked was in order for you, your district, to get, um, let's say, 20, 25 seats in others. Mm -hmm. So that means you can have 25 students not taking the same class, but 25 students taking any kind of online virtual course that's offered. A teacher in your in your district has to also teach a course. Yeah. You know, so she took that step. But um, I don't know how far it went because I don't believe that there was a tremendous rush to the door of there people to participate. Then, yeah. And well, both on teacher's side, mm. you know, and mm -hmm. and possibly I don't know about the student side, but you know. So I know it's been looked at, and I, I don't think it's been totally, you know, thrown out the window. But, you know, that just that takes getting teachers on board to do those type of things, you know. And then you need to think of, uh, from Jeff's point of view, you know, is, uh, I know there was a concern in there, not just, not with him, but I mean just in the literature in general, is it a one-to-one? -one? You know, people who haven't taken online courses aren't comfortable with the idea that th the rigor of an online course is equal to the rigor of a face-to-face -face course. 
anyone who's taken an online course really knows in many ways it's more rigorous yeah. to take an online course than it is to do a face-to-face -face course. But it also means the student has to be self-directed and motivated. And have so access. it's not for everybody. Sorry? And have access to technology. And have access I mean, at an home possibly. Issue. You know. um, what Carol was saying made me think about um, the high school and the block scheduling and how this past year there was um, an elective course that only had six students in it. <laughs> And so I think when we get to the point of really looking and evaluating, um, I think we need to look at that as well. Because um, that was just not nice to see that there were so few students taking right. this one particular course. It was course. one course. Well, it was one course, but we I mean, that's. So if you'd eliminated that course, you wouldn't necessarily save that. You wouldn't eliminate a job. Well, I think we need to look at the whole block scheduling thing, and the, and the reason that those they were th that that course wasn't eliminated is because of the block scheduling. And I think again, it's something that when we look at, you know, like not slashing all of athletics, but looking within it. And I think, mm -hmm. and th this goes back to what I was saying before about how looking at all the programs that we offer. I mean, I think we need to start a comprehensive review of of everything, and is everything that we're offering are we doing it in the best? way for our value and so and I think that that might be you might need because to he because I remember Je I asked sorry I asked Jeff about it and he said well we couldn't eliminate it because of the way the scheduling was set up yeah. and I understand those six kids need to go somewhere but disseminating six kids into a high school of a thousand is not going to overcrowd one particular class they're not well, all going to yeah, go to the same I'm place sure so I true. anyway I think that needs to go along with uh, you know the overall looking at, at what we're doing um, so throwing ideas on the table, um, I've thought about this and I have had, have, I've had other people suggest it too. It's, I don't have any idea whether it would actually work or if, if it's actually even legal. Um, <laughs> gambling, no. <laughs> <laughs> just a math the class. Says yeah. no. Just a math class. Statistics. <laughs> Online gambling. Um, you know, so I've had a, a number of people in the community, you know, suggest to me that you know, they'd be willing to, to pay more money, not in taxes, but, you know, so I'm thinking just for example, you know, we've set aside $150,000 in our budget for technology, even though we'd like to have more, you know, but there must be people in the community and corporate citizens throughout the area who might be willing to contribute to a fund that would then, so if we were to raise, we've talked about this at the technology committee, right. you know, if we were able to raise from individual contributions a hundred, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, that means we could take a hundred and fifty thousand dollars out of the budget next year and we can buy technology with that money and save the taxpayers some money. These are short term and it's really more of a band-aid and <coughs> I really don't know if it's legal and whether that needs to go into the general fund like everything else goes into the general fund and, you know, quietly just uh, disappears. So. I have no idea. It would be a great thing for Wave to think about. It's just to since they're follow in that, and oddly enough, I had a discussion with uh, somebody I've been working with on the SIP committee, and her and her husband are very much willing, and I think you can do specific type funds and so forth. And this person said, look, there must be those, she didn't, they don't understand about free and reduced lunch, but there are students uh -huh. that might not be able to do it. She would be more than willing to pay for one, her and her husband would be more than willing to pay for oh, one like child to have lunch. Type of thing. Mm -hmm every day so again that could go into a fund to help reduce and that child would then be able to have a very good meal and again it may be somebody who doesn't okay. qualify okay. for free and reduce but is on the bubble huh. and and then but you have, oh, I'm so, wait, the I'm sorry. you have to think about the fact when you that free and reduced number is also the number Title that makes one. you eligible yeah. for this would grants be, because yeah. there's a there's a line for which SAU 50 isn't eligible for grants because of the economic too stability of our communities. And so with that, True. We, we're not eligible. But right. if Portsmouth has a big enough number of people who rent and those kinds of things and they, you have a free and reduced population, that makes you eligible. And yeah. in fact, I think that just the last big grant that you had was at the middle school, that three-year grant. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what it was technology. called. Technology. No, it wasn't technology. The, 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 oh, the it, homework it, club thing? It was started as the homework club originally. Right. Yeah. And then it, I mean, it started the homework club evolved from out of that with those big sisters the uh, Fannie Mae yeah the Fannie, Fannie Mae Foundation, Fannie Mae. Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah speaking of Grant White as my wife wrote that grant oh that's right she did yeah I'm sorry Ann and then Leslie well I had just a lot of little kind of piddly things but if you put them all together I I had had questions about what would be the cost of moving people as well but uh, also uh, adult education it's a very very small amount that we support mm -hmm. but uh, I feel more strongly we need to be 
taking care of our children's mm -hmm. education before we worry about the, the adults. Uh, also, the late bus. Uh, I think you all got a letter from somebody uh, today and a couple of uh, comments about lowering the temperature, and I know a lot of schools have done that, lowering the temperature. I know that doesn't work for the middle school because you're roasting one room and freezing in the other, no matter what you do. But in terms of the other schools, uh, I, I think. And, and then instead of an assistant superintendent, uh, maybe readjusting the way the high school works with, with the assistant principals. Uh, again, job description kind of thing. I don't have an idea in mind, just hmm. a thought. Okay. And late bus, did I say late bus? Yes. <coughs> oh, you did. Uh, one of the things that I've been noticing is the art speak donations that come into the city mm -hmm. and it might be they're they're huge mm -hmm. you know just since February 16th it's upwards of twenty thousand dollars so it might be um, a good idea to talk with whoever is administrating that program and finding out how their you know what is their mechanism for soliciting donations for how can that money be used a cemetery yeah. committee too so there are other committees in the city that are soliciting donations mm -hmm. that are able to keep their money. So how is that working? And you know, can we piggyback on some of that or use some of their ideas? And um, it might be worth talking about talking to the city more about that. Yes. Oftentimes there are grants uh, to the police department that show up on the agenda as yeah. well. Yep. So that and that goes back to the grant writer huh. situation. And do they have a grant writer? I don't know. No. Uh, but the grant, the, the proposal to right, look into getting one. I don't know. I don't know. But there's yeah, always donations. There's always donations coming in right. or um, grants. I think to, in response to the question about, you know, looking deeper into the athletics and, and looking at those that, you know, not cutting across everything, but just looking at specific programs, um, you know, there is that sheet that was handed out. So everybody yes. should have that, which just gives you a r very rough sense of. Uh, of numbers and breaks it down by salaries and supplies and just so that you know that remind you that you have that and the whole number is three hundred and thirty four thousand uh, dollars okay so any yes Lisa. well I, I just want to kind of take a step back a little bit and think about I mean I think Dexter started off asking what the you know priorities were and had we sort of you know created buckets of priorities and levels um, and I think I think what we have to remember is that the budget that we spent a lot of time developing um, had three driving priorities um, and fundamental objectives that you know protecting the instructional core and um, keeping student services strong there are cuts there but um, you know mm -hmm. We believe it's sustainable and um, and maintaining the extracurriculars, so it's a, a protective factor. Um, so you know, I mean, below that, and, and you said the 2.8 percent keeps us moving forward. So below that, the big bucket is we're not moving forward and we're not protecting those objectives, and that's you know kind of right. the simple um, mm -hmm. end of it. And I want to make sure that people understand or remember that even with the tightening budgets since I've sat on the board and you know probably before that that the district has um, been able to take strides forward even though you know maybe we haven't gotten the technology that we need we're you know behind on our facilities um, our class size is creeping up I mean those are things that are very visible impacts from tightening budgets um, but quietly and without an impact to the bottom line we've kind of moved toward you know the PLCs and we've moved toward developing different assessments and really focusing on um, student learning mm -hmm. um, we've gotten as much money as we can get that's been out there as far as the big grant at the middle school for technology um, you know we've got the money for the R money you know that we were able to get you know, so I want to just make sure that people know that even though we've been cutting, we're quietly moving forward. And, you know, we've got the middle school project moving forward. There are more and more people coming from SAU 50. We've got a lot of national recognition. And I think it's really important to not just nitpick away at all the programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to look at them holistically. We need to look at technology, how that can be leveraged. But, you know, that's in its 
infancy. And so if you, you know, if you read the research, it's all over the map as to what will work and what won't work and, right. and how you implement it um, and, and the equity issues involved with, you know, the fact that it's, it's private education, you know, basically within your schools. Um, you know, there are a lot of issues, there are a lot, a lot of promise, but a lot of issues to work out. So before you just say, oh, let's go do that, let's go do that, we really have to think holistically and, and long, ter long term. Um, I think that when I look at the research as to, you know, what is working, you know, there's a big article in um, the New York Times Sunday on charter schools and, you know, their success. And if you look at that 30% that, that is having good success, and you look at what their key operating objectives are, they're here, and we have those. And, and mm -hmm. we don't want to get rid of those. You know, we don't want to go back and get in line for you know, something that we're already doing. So I, just, you know, I want people to remember that um, as we have these discussions. Tom. Yeah, just to, uh, to follow up on, on that, I mean, I think uh, I, I really mirror a lot of the comments that you make uh, listening to all the different ideas. I think, you know, one of the things that is really key here is that, you know, that these ideas, whether some are good, some are not so good, the point being is that, you know, if we have a good idea, you know, we should be implementing it. You know, that, you know, we don't have a point in time when we suddenly, you know, come down and huddle to figure out, you know, okay, we, we got to find some ways to do things. You know, that, you know, this is an ongoing process that, you know, we're focused on what I would call continuous improvement. That uh, if we find uh, nuggets of goodness, uh, whatever time and place they are, uh, that we jump on them. You know, that we're not sitting there trying to squeeze, you know, the balloon into a shape that it really is not supposed to be in. So, you know, um, I, uh, I like the conversation. You know, we might have something that uh, comes out of it. We might not. But uh, uh, I, I want the conversation to continue and, and that it's not something that just happens during, you know, a time of need, uh, but it's more uh, of a, uh, a philo philosophical approach that we take that says that, you know, we're, we're focused on continuous improvement. And, you know, sometimes we find something, sometimes we don't. Right. And how, how do we maintain the things that we are doing right, you know, even in, in the difficult economic times? Because there are also vulnerabilities that, um, that are real for us. I mean, our elementary, two of our three elementary schools are, you know, experiencing leadership transitions. You know, that can be great and it can be, you know, a difficult thing. All of our elementary schools are experiencing a bubble, so class size is going up. Um, Little Harbor is getting close to needing officially a, an, assistant super, or an assistant principal, because I think the number's 500, they're gonna be at 420 next year. 450. And it, 450, 450 next year, they're at 420 now. Um, you know, so, and they lost Title I, and yet they still have the highest number of free and reduced you know, the highest rate right. reduced number in the city. So there are definite vulnerabilities that we need to right. protect. Protect. think about. Yeah. Right. Think about. Dexter. Um, <clears throat> so what our experience has been that we know is that when things get cut, it's very difficult um, to, input, to, to reintroduce them. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of the next two years, I would argue that we protect at, at almost all cost, our programs, because once they're lost, um, they're, they're impossible to bring back. And so, um, uh, and 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 I would argue that this is going to be a two or three year cycle, and it won't it, it will it won't always be like this. That the state revenue, in fact, w the economy will come back, the state revenues will increase, um, the state will stop pushing down expenses to the towns and cities. Um, because remember, we don't have a cost problem here. We have a revenue problem for the city. So w whatever we do, um, and I like the ideas of, 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 tr of trying to reorganize some of the leadership roles. Um, I like the idea of working with the teachers union because at the end of the day, um, that, that um, although it's painful, um, it's something that can be recovered, if you will, because you're, you're, not, you're not cutting back program. Um, and I just strongly encourage us to, over the next two years, uh, to, to try and protect the, 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 the key programs we have. Because um, as Lisa said, it's precious. We actually have it right. Um, we're doing a lot of good things. And um, I think we can, we can reduce costs, but still 
insulate those reductions. So, I mean, th this, th this would be um, um, catastrophic to the district and to the programs that we've built. Right. And it would be catastrophic Great. to the students. Great. It would. Yeah. That's zero. Yes. I, I just wanted to talk about revenue for a minute because one of the questions that keeps popping up in my mind, and Steve, you may know the answer to this better, but we're not allowed to keep our revenue. So, and there was discussion at the end of um, the budget season last year with John Dohenko about can we keep our revenue? If we so, have extra. What's that? If we have money left over. If we have money yeah. left over at the end. But also, um, <coughs> if, but also, you know, some of the things we're talking about um, could make us money. You know, I think Carol mentioned mm -hmm. charging at football games again. Where does that money go? Um, the I don't know if people got a chance to read yeah. this letter. Mm -hmm. um, one of the suggestions that the um, woman who wrote this made, and she had a lot of really good suggestions, was um, a central website set up by the school where donors can contribute online for an organization or a designated fund, something what, like what you were talking about, mm -hmm. which is, um, what's that? And what Mitch was talking about. Uh, and what Mitch was talking about, with something like, a food, you know, fund, um, and now that the city has that ability to take credit cards um, online, that that's a new thing. Maybe we can talk to the city about doing that. Um, another thing she talked about, and this is a great idea, is a wish list. Can we post a wish list on, you know, the the city's website or our school website or whatever, so that you know, schools that need a specific thing can get that mm -hmm. um, if somebody has it. So I think Ken's right. There are people out there who are willing to help. Um, also, corporate sponsors, you know, can we go and ask? You know, can we start talking to, um, cor you know, yeah. asking for corporate sponsors? I mean, certainly ArtSpeak gets a lot of them. Um, so I guess I'd like to know more about how, how that might work and if the city right. is willing to work with us on that. Like naming rights. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say one of the programs at New Franklin Perhaps that we're doing is adoptaclassroom.org. <laughs> And it's where people can put in specific things. So, and we've talked about doing it by grade level, and I'm sure you could accommodate doing it by school level too. So, if schools need, and that's that's the wish list. And since that's a donation from parents, the idea was instead of giving them a mug at Christmas, um, you know, if teachers really need, you know, Kleenex or whatever supply they need, and so then that sort of circumvents the whole going back into the general fund because it's a donation to the classroom. So. And we could do that citywide too, so that the city hall could get their tissues donated too, just like the middle school. They could have a tissue drive and paper drive and all of that. There'll be a lot of tears. <laughs> you got that right. There's going to be. Kent. Uh, it, kinds of things that I had thoughts in, uh, on here. And, and again, I think, you know, there are multitudes of ways to have revenue. I don't think it's always going to be gigantic. I did give a couple of ex examples that I do believe can be high revenue producing, but. It's odd that we're sitting here, and Dexter made the point uh, in regards to, you know, in a few years, the state, the feds, the county, you know, are going to probably have some money. I mean, it's cyclatory to a degree. But a year ago, I was madder than hell, and still don't agree with it, that the federal government dumped billions of dollars into the car industry. And, and I may not philosophically <laughs> agree with that. But isn't it odd that here we are, a school district with the most precious resource, not the goddamn car, but the most precious resource being the kids, that federal government's not dumping a dime into us to revitalize and make sure schools don't fail. You know, the success is, is that GM and, and Chrysler, who got very large amounts of money, you know, did the right thing. They, they, they have been able to start to pay it back, and some of them fully, with interest. Well, you know, I challenge the federal government. I challenge Judd Gregg, Carol Shea Porter, our representatives, to look at it, investing immediately back into the school system and seeing what the return we would have. We're not just siphoning money off, and that's what sometimes public education gets looked at. We're a public education. We're not a free education. And sometimes people get the two mixed up somehow. And I'll be quite honest, we house crossroads. And we have a very high transient rate of very difficult students. And we don't get really a damn thing from that. And I think that's wrong, that we have certain pockets like that and do not get our just money to help those individuals in the deepest needs because they are the biggest 
needs of, of students when they come in. Not their fault. But if you look at foundation money and if you look at race to the top money and government money, where that flows into are very low performing districts who gotta fail. Who <laughs> are adopting the sorts of things that we are doing here right, right now right, and right. we're not gonna qualify for those funds. Bill Gates is not gonna Far say, enough. Oh Portsmouth, you Portsmouth need me. Easy. He's not gonna do it. But he's looking at Portsmouth and he's saying, These are the things that you're doing right, these are the things we need to replicate in order to turn districts around. And if we cut those things, if we cut our programs, right. we're not going to have those things anymore. That's right. Yeah. We're not coming back. And nobody's going to give us money. Right. So if I could um, uh, just sort of sort of sum, sum up a couple, a couple of things. <laughs> uh, one is I think people need to remember that there's a public hearing coming up. Um, and I think people need to remember how many people came out to the last public hearing and actually spoke in support of uh, the 2.8 percent budget that we gave. Just to, to make that point, because that auditorium, I think, was quite full. Um, m many people, <laughs> myself included, were actually stunned by the number of people mm, who showed up. That's great. Um, I think to Lisa's point that she's made tonight and in the past, and I read an article recently on this as well, which has to do with the kinds of intervention program we have. You know, I think there are, as some counselors were suggesting, maybe we can think of ways to do better with less. I think it's important to point out that there are strategies we already have in place that have just been in place for maybe a year, particularly the, the intervention strategy, that really is a a potential money saving program because you're ca you're going to catch those kids before they fall uh, and end up with IEPs and then it's going to be very expensive you know so i think we really need to exactly as you suggest we do need to protect the core and you know going back to that um, i just drew it again at earlier you know that concentric circle uh, model that I had in my mind when we were initially talking about the budget, the core, which hasn't gotten any smaller, but then there's the unified arts and special teacher services that has gotten a little smaller, and then there's the su support services all the way around, and that's just sort of coming in. So I think the point about protecting the core really, really is key. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that Kent was saying in terms of the money that might even be available to do some of these from the City Council, uh, you know, not everything necessarily saves money. You know, some of these programs are expensive. Uh, I, I've talked to a couple of people in other districts, principals in other districts. We no longer have math science coordinators, and we seem to be doing okay, but I mean... We need the math. We need the math, right. You know, so, but that's something that, you know, citizens and taxpayers who don't necessarily have kids in schools and know exactly what goes on in schools don't have a clear clue as to what that kind of job means and it seems per, uh, you know sort of superfluous because they're not involved in front of a classroom but oftentimes you know I think the teachers would agree and everyone knows you know uh, talking about curriculum keeping focused having professional development I mean curriculum coordinators fit into that I can't imagine we'll ever have them again but you know I just want to make the point that you know I th there are things that we do need that are important that will help continual continuous improvement and uh, nuggets of goodness which I wrote that down because I think that was a great little phrase. <laughs> um, and uh, I also think we do need to be very careful from the teacher's point of view because I think one of the biggest problems in education is what I would consider to be, you know, change fatigue. <clears throat> I mean, all these great new ideas that come in and come in, everybody who's new on a board has a great idea, and the next thing you know you're implementing it, and all of a sudden, you know, teachers who've been around for a long time, they've seen so many great ideas come and go. <laughs> Uh, and it's really the core in the classroom and the curriculum of what they're doing. And, you know, I don't think, for example, I don't think technology is, is going to be going away soon. But I just think as we talk about these things and consider implementation, we need to be a little careful and keep the teachers in mind. Because we may think they're great ideas, but we're not the ones implementing them in the classroom. The teachers have to adopt the idea. They have to buy into the idea. They actually have to believe that, you know, this innovative idea is better than what they're doing. If it's not better than what they believe they're already doing, um, I'm not so sure most teachers would adopt that idea. So we just need to be a little bit careful. Um, and I just want to also point out, so this is a public document. The City Council will be able to see these numbers that we're talking about. Maybe we could actually forward it to them, for, you know, officially. Uh, yes? I, I suggest that this, you, uh, you're probably going to do this, Ed, is to reorganize, reorganize this mm -hmm. sort of by, by um, school, school span, level. Grade so, span, so you, yep. you have the elementary schools and middle schools so that you get a sense of where those cuts are. Okay. okay. 
Ann. I wondered also whether or not some of this could be lumped together to indicate this little clump of things would represent roughly 1%. And this little clump of, not little, big clump of things would perhaps. Okay. I think that's what the city council is looking for. Yeah, but the, the only reason we're I not don't want to do that, that because we haven't we haven't decided what the clumping appropriate clumps levels. are. All I'm saying well, is, is that that, that just <laughs> you can have just a percentage. Percentage. So here's the only yeah. Yeah. Say yeah. percentage. But it's what Ann's really asking is it student impact? Is that what you're saying? I mean, you could give you know. You know, the paraprofessionals, one each at the elementary school, that's maybe that paraprofessional has 10 students under them or something. I mean, I think if you say, I mean, what we don't have, and, and I don't think you, you'd have solid numbers, but, you know, what does one para normally have? It has, you know, responsibility of X amount of students. Yeah, some yeah, of them have the entire first grade. Yeah, but I mean, some, of them, some of them have t two well, grades. Yeah, I'm, under I'm just, them. I mean, there are others here. Right. We know how many kids right. are out for athletics. We know how many. Right. Um, I forget what the other one was. Uh, music and drama. We know right. with the, the number of students in each one of those. Right. Mr. Marlin. Well, the idea is, I think everybody has agreed, and the con consensus has been that it's not prioritizing at this stage of the right. game. Right. It's no. showing impact. So to take mm. Ann's thing a little further, you could put a little scale on there that said 1% represents this amount of money, 2% or something like that. You give them a scale and they can look at the pieces and okay. figure yeah. out. Yeah, I think where that's they a great are. idea. Instead of that, that way you're not that because way you're not, not clumping and you're not prioritizing. Right. Yeah, I like that. I like the impact yeah. idea. In fact, the administrator, you guys had come out earlier in the process with uh, an impact state. Mm -hmm. You know, and so rather than the priority, to, that would be helpful as to how you feel that these different cuts would actually impact. If you group them by school, then you could yeah, say yeah. for these, for these right. uh, uh, reductions at the elementary school level, here, be, here would be the impact, either in um, reduced uh, program, um, number of increased students per class, whatever it is. Right. It would be worthwhile in the middle school, the reduction in unified arts means instead of 12 weeks, they would get six yeah. weeks and six weeks of study hall. But I think that's a discussion that maybe has to happen further. Yeah. You know, that we decided not to have. I don't yeah. know if that's We're what the really city asked for, the city council right. asked for, what, what's, right. the, what's the impact? Because, you know, you raise class size, maybe you add, you know, more time to your delayed opening days, because as you're analyzing more research per teacher, they might need an extra hour or half hour, or, you know what I mean? Like, there's there's just a lot of impacts, I think, that right. happen, and I don't know that you couldn't be, um, we want to be. You couldn't be comprehensive enough. in any summary. Right. So, uh, Rebecca. Um, I just in this whole discussion about talking about how good we are and how Bill Gates won't give us anything because we are such a great school district. Um, I suddenly had this thought that as great and wonderful as we are, we're still lacking, I think. So, you know, we're, we're at this budget and it's okay, but it was originally a seven point something budget and we're still getting rid of the technology integrator at the high school, yeah, exactly. which moving yeah. forward is going to be key. Right. We still don't offer world language at the elementary school. We're getting outpaced by everybody else in the world and in our country. So I think, you know, as great and wonderful as we are, we're still Losing. falling behind. We're still inadequate. I think we, we offer an inadequate product right now, and we're being asked to make it even, even less. That's not to disparage our teachers at all. We are doing a wonderful job with what we have, but we're not doing our complete job. We, we are not offering everything that we need to to make our kids competitive. So I think we need to remember that also, that we're lacking a lot. Okay. Uh, okay, last thought maybe? Yes, last thought. Um, okay. And this may be more food for thought, Ed, than an actual suggestion. Um, but I'm wondering if you could describe some of these things um, that would be cut more from the perspective of a child Sorry. rather than as so much of an administrator. And, I, and I, I have heard this criticism of us before that we don't put things in the terms of a child and, and it's more abstract. And we don't want it to be abstract. We want it to be real. And we want them to say, this is what a child's life will be like if we cut this. And I think Tom Freeney wants to hear that. He wants to know. How is this going to affect kids? And so I would just make a suggestion or food for thought to just characterize things in a way that is professional but also puts it in the perspective of a child. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so just a reminder, um, we have a meeting next week on Wednesday, not on Tuesday. Um, Time the, and location? Uh, I don't have it. It's, it's the, the uh, regular regular business. meeting. It's 7 o'clock here in the city hall. Yeah. On Wednesday. The regular schedule. And Monday is the um, public hearing at the high school, part two. And Tuesday is the city council's meeting for themselves to discuss budget. Yes. Well, just finish your schedules. I have a schedule item that I'd like to just. I'm done. Okay. So uh, I mentioned it before. I'll remind you again next week. But get on your calendars May 19th, which is the JBC meeting where the JBC will discuss a proposal for um, phasing at the middle school. Oh yeah. That then this board will receive on the following Tuesday, uh, May 25th, for a discussion and uh, I hope approval. So uh, it, it will be important, I, I would say it would be important for all of us to be at that 519 meeting so that you can hear um, Gil Bain, who is our construction manager, um, present their proposed phasing for the middle school. So you're actually looking for a vote on the 25th. We are looking for because the, the, to say, the timeline to stay on is so schedule, tight. The timeline yeah. so tight for us to stay on schedule. We're looking for a vote from this board on May 25th. Time and location. Um, it's 6.30 at the it's Levinson room, right? At the yes. library? Oh. 6.30 library. Levinson room at the library. At the library. 6.30, um, May 19th. Okay. And just a clarification, yes, the, school, the regular school board meeting is, is next, next week, Wednesday. Wednesday. Not Tuesday as, it's, okay. as they usually are. That's Wednesday, I think that. Here, 7 o'clock? Well, yes, here. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Thank